So in those opening moments of making the 911 call, there are three people in the room. There is you, there is your husband, and there is the call taker. Tell me about that feeling. Um, yeah, it's a very strange phenomenon, but that is the call taker is the only person in the, the room with you, the only person that goes through that experience with you. Um, and it it does create this, this sense of um, connection and, and a bond with that person that they're the only person who knows exactly what it felt like to be there that day. Even the the person you're doing CPR on, even, you know, when it's a loved one, even they don't, don't understand um, fully what it was like. So that is a really special thing. And, and anytime you can be able to reach out to that person afterward and meet them, that is, that is a really special moment. And uh, I think that's a, a lifelong bond. They quite rightly deserve the title Heroes in Headsets. And uh, I think that uh, everybody should acknowledge that life-saving begins with a phone call. Would you agree with that? What do you think? I absolutely do. I have said from the beginning that Lisa is my hero. My, my call taker is my hero. Um, because, And I credit her with saving my husband's life because I had no idea that he was having a cardiac arrest or that he needed CPR. She knew. She's the one that that knew what to do to save him and instructed me in doing it. If she had not been there, he would not be here either. So she's absolutely, you know, our hero. You are clearly the, the poster person for doing good and effective CPR and also staying exceptionally calm given the circumstances that you faced. But uh, I mean, what do you say to other people that are perhaps reluctant to to learn CPR? I would say, you know, it can, there's no downside, really. You can't hurt the person because they're dead. <laughs> so, and if they're not and they need, you know, you need to stop doing it, they will be sure to let you know. They will push you off of them or they will, you know, indicate in some way that they, that they are alive and don't need to be resuscitated. But um, don't be afraid if it's going to hurt them, it's better to be a little bit injured than to be dead. So, um, you know, you may, you may crack some ribs, you may feel some funny things. It's certainly difficult to do and difficult to, to see, um, but it's the only chance that person has at, at continuing their life. As the significant other of someone that's undergoing and undergone cardiac arrest, you made some excellent points in your keynote this morning about how the, the first responder and others should communicate with you because you're going through trauma and shock at the same time. So what are your kind of words of wisdom on that? Yeah, just see that that person is there and that they, they in many ways, are just as much of a patient as the person who had the cardiac arrest. Um, the person who had it did not experience it consciously. Um, their body certainly did, but their mind didn't. And with the person who responded, it's the opposite. Their body didn't experience it, but their mind did. And it is a very traumatizing thing to do and to witness and um, reaching out to that person and seeing that they are there and trying to, you know, have some empathy and compassion toward them and understand what they might need and try to try to provide that or connect them with someone who can provide that. And obviously, both you and your husband are now championing a lot of stuff on social media, but uh, talk about your work, particularly in CPR and uh, cardiac arrest survival. Yeah, I try to use our experience for good. Ours was during the height of the COVID pandemic, and so it's, it's kind of an extreme example of, of what can happen, what can go well and what can go poorly, um, but I think that the lessons are in the extremes, and so I think we are well suited to be able to speak to that. And um, also, it's just personally meaningful and helpful because um, it's kind of like fertilizer, you know, if, if it's just a big stinking pile of crap, you know, then it, nobody likes it. But if you add light and a little water and give it some time, then something really beautiful can grow out of it if it had a purpose. So there's a lot of healing in that. You concluded uh, in your session this morning with a very sort of special message, I think, to, you know, those in the room, those healthcare professionals. And, uh, you know, what should they be thinking about as well? Yeah, just to remember that before you are whatever your job is, you are a human and this other person is a human. And so 
even if you're not sure what the right thing is to say, or you haven't been trained in that particular area, or that's not the, you're not a psychologist or a psychiatrist or whatever, uh, you are human and you know how to interact with other humans. And so just, just show that humanity um, to the other person and your interactions with them and, and reach out to help just person to person. Classic journalistic question to end with. Is there anything I have forgotten to ask or anything you want to tell us? Um, well, you forgot to ask who's funnier. Me or my husband. <laughs> Clearly, it's my husband. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it. I'm, I'm actually so... <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first that uh, there is a funnier member of the family, <laughs> although you were inspirational this morning. Thank you so much. Back to you. <laughs>